Good supper. Good morning. My name is Michael Dexter, and I will be speaking about institutionalizing FreeBSD isolated and virtualized hosts using BSD install, ZFS, and NFSD. You can find me online in various places. And thank you, everyone who attended BeehiveCon yesterday. I will follow my slides pretty closely, reading some of them. Not all of you are native English speakers, and I know that's helpful. Those who have given a TED talk, we can turn your nose up at me all you want. And I will give a lot of information to you today. You're welcome to interrupt me with questions, especially if they're context specific. There are countless questions on everything in life, and I'm happy to address whichever present themselves. So regarding institutionalizing, I know that's a big word, and I will use it in this context for integrating. FreeBSD has had jails since the year 2000. It's had Beehive since 2014, I believe. And those have played an important role in the OS and the surrounding tools, but I personally do not believe they are yet integrated into the OS for effortless use. In, in all opportunities, and I'm sure you each have an opinion on that, and I'm welcome to hear that later, but this is what I think this could look like. When you have an operating system with integrated containment and isolation tools, how do we remove barriers between subsystems, users, tools like this? Anyway, so integration of those tools. I will focus on FreeBSD, but this fundamentally will apply to any operating system with a hypervisor included, as long as it is a POSIX environment, a traditional Unix environment. Uh, Windows now has a hypervisor built in, to their credit. They, ironically, as of last year, have a Unix environment. I do not know if those two speak to one another, but that's far outside the scope of this talk. As for isolated and virtualized, Jail and Beehive. One is a containment mechanism that contains processes and uh, is very lightweight in nature. One is a hypervisor, which is a lot heavier weight in nature, which provides a synthetic machine to virtual guests. So you can boot the same OS or a different version of the same OS or a completely foreign OS. Something that is somewhat available in a container if there's, say, ABI, ABI compatibility, but that's a, an edge case. So, Essentially, ABIs versus ISAs. Um, I won't peek out on those today. And finally, BSD installs NFS and NFSD. I suppose they go in re reverse chronological order there. You've probably heard of NFS. It's been around since the 80s. That's a network file system. Uh, ZFS, a very good file system. I will not go too deep into that. There's much said about that. Uh, it's very well documented. And finally, the FreeBSD installer, BSD install. It's OK. It's not perfect. And I will talk about what it does well and what it does not do well in service of the goal here today. And of those, the BSD install components would be the least applicable to other operating systems. I don't know if anyone's picked it up, but yeah. So there are broad motivations here. Probably heard me talk about virtualization and multiplicity things for a very long time. And people want this stuff. They want to virtualize. They want to contain the Docker zone droplets and all these things. And you probably each have your own motivation, your own tool of choice. And great, I think the more the merrier. We learn from one another. It is fantastic to hear that some developers use multiple tools for development or of course of their work. And I bless their hearts which raises the question, are we contained yet? Have we achieved the goal of all these nifty tools? Looking at a support of Docker containment, what, what, what's the litmus test for success in containing applications? Well, applications want to be isolated. I'd argue jails have done that very well for a very long time with various strategies to drop an application into a little sandbox, if you will, and poke at it. Atomic snapshotting is important to all things Docker and containment, so that if you splat out an application, you can return to a previous state. 
That would be great if the file system supported that. That's dependency satisfaction. There are countless ways to satisfy the needs of an application. Some of it automated, some of it extremely manual. Things like overlay file systems where differences appear atop one another. That's remarkably useful when playing with, say, versions, different dependencies, you name it. The notion of read-only applications in the context of disposable machines, you spin them up and throw them away, it's great. And reproducibility, where one developer has a development environment that is hopefully identical to that of another development developer, so you never hear the words, it built on my box. It builds on my box, ship my box. Ship my box, exactly. So let's narrow in on these motivations beyond all things cloud and container and stuff. So early, early on, I'd argue this whole discussion began with Unix v7 when they introduced Cheroot. And they found it useful for packaging up the OS, building it in a nice contained environment. It tricked applications into thinking the root of the OS was something different. And the application had no idea that it was something different, and it didn't matter. So that was, oh, well, okay, the dates of kind of moment. Uh, there's a concept called RPM Hell, which is out of the Red Hat branch of the new Linux. I believe that's why I'm here today. In the late 90s, uh, I was in, I'm living in a very Red Hat town, and I spun up a Red Hat 5.2 server and discovered this thing called Red Hat Hell, you're welcome, to, or RPM Hell, you're welcome to look that up elsewhere. But essentially, when you install an application on the OS, extracting it is remarkably difficult. And not facilitated by any of the tools, unfortunately. And finally, to isolate and diversify. That is, here's an application. We don't trust it. Let's put it somewhere safer. In the, the year of Meltdown Inspector, all bets are off in many regards, but we do what we can. And to diversify, if you're running operating system A, you might want to write to run operating system B. You should have that right. You have that right. So looking back, that, that cheroot was 1979. I was quite young. <laughs> Many of you were quite young. We're not yet here. And back in 74 was Popeck and Goldberg. They laid out the rules for virtualization. They described type 1 hypervisors. They said, hey, here are the qualities of what we're talking about. And I've spoken to that point in the past. You're welcome to look it up. It's a great paper from 1974. It just set the stage for all of this, just like Chirut did. And it's amazing how little can change in so long. So even further narrowing down on motivations. Um, for me personally, last year, 2017, was the year of dropping everything and testing everything. And everything is testing. Uh, regressions are brutal. They are. Unfortunate. These operating systems have great reputations like ftp.cdrom.com, the highest traffic site of the internet. It delivered X number of gigabytes per day. When any component of that stops working, it is disappointing, <laughs> to put it real politely. Uh, it is frustrating. It is politically suicide in some regards. It is, it's a problem, and we should all be attuned to the risk of regression. And in the context of regressions is paleophobia, the irrational fear of the past, old stuff. I know we, we all have our shiny new thing, this amazing device that controls lights and, and lines. At my house, I do this old stuff where you like, pull the card up and then flip the switch. That's cool, but it has a place. And let's, let's all determine where is the best for the new tool and the old tool, and hopefully a nice harmony between the two. And about regressions, software ceasing to work, and this paleophobia, this future orientation, this passion for the now and tomorrow, and mm, the collective, some would have the collective mem memory of goldfish, that, well, that's old code, it's the new stuff that's important, which is great, that's core to development, but there's also a place for old stuff. Let's go through the tale of two regressions. Two regressions that bit me personally, and I'll just run through them pretty quickly. Uh, 
some of you will be familiar with FreeBSD connect tags and flags and name, name it. Some won't. Bear with me. Hopefully this will be clear. I'm pulling directly from the uh, source code commit text of, well, let's fix a memory leak. I'm calling this one the don't use ZFS on FreeBSD button because it had unfortunate consequences. The bug was introduced in June of 2017 in the development branch of FreeBSD. It was resolved on October 1st, and it was essentially out there for three months. It was fixed 3,710 commits later, and I'm very glad someone fixed it. That's great. So in a broader context, the folks at FreeNAS grabbed that change. It's a it's a good change that they introduced in principle. It added new fun functionality, but it did have a little regression hiding it, which happened to be a memory leak. That doesn't always show up immediately like some regressions. It just goes bang in your face. But over time, especially if you use it at scale, it would implode, unfortunately. So it slipped into FreeNAS and shipped in FreeNAS 11.1. That was released December 13th, long after the bug was both identified and fixed. And then it was later fixed on the 18th, 36 days later. Not the end of the world, but, but the subsystem storage worked great the month before, then didn't work in catastrophic ways that would create a memory leak, would start swapping, start killing off processes, and kill off the box. Not ideal in a storage environment, in my humble opinion. Number two, a little more interesting. Uh, a developer fixed a POSIX compliant issue that's arguably been out there a very, very long time. Uh, the majority of us are not aware of that exact issue, might not even understand the exact nature of it, but it was a POSIX compliant issue. And that improvement was added in 2014. Let's see, do I have this? It was fixed in 17, three years later, 81,000 commits later. I call this one the don't use FreeBSD with Samba. Uh, I don't use much Samba, but I hear there are people who use Samba. It allows Windows machines and Macs and other even Unix machines to connect to FreeBSD. Somewhat important. And like the memory leak, this did not reveal itself unless you pushed pretty hard on the system. Uh, if I've got some real world examples. If you have the electron microscope photographing the CPU wafer as it comes off the machine, it takes a high resolution image of it and throws it in a directory and thinks about the next one. Well, that became a problem. Or the lumber mill with pieces of wood flying by, you photograph a barcode, you drop the image in a directory on Samba on FreeBSD, and it would create performance issues. So FreeBSD 9.3 arrived in 2014, the bug was introduced shortly after the release, or not shortly before. And let's see, FreeBSD 10 arrived, including the bug. <coughs> 9.3 was end of life in 2016. Some of you will care about this stuff, some of you won't, that's okay. It was resolved in 2017, and it was fixed in FreeBSD 11, uh, July of 2017. Now, of these dates, some of them are very important. The end of life date of FreeBSD 9.3 where it was not present, and it's fixed in FreeBSD 11.1. So that left a gap, I'll call it the regression gap, a gap of seven months where the working software was off the radar of the project while working on the future. At this point, development is not on FreeBSD 11, it's far ahead in FreeBSD 10, 12. So it was seven months of the software being officially ancient history, and nine months of my time trying to convince developers we have a problem, and being berated in this very room a year ago today on, on hey, works on my box. <laughs> the problem behind it. So I did hear at a recent event any efforts spent in the past is to pry from current. If you are spending any time in a volunteer context where time is precious, I've got three kids, you all have day jobs, hobbies, lives. You are doing a disservice to the project to spend any time outside of current. 
I suppose I see that perspective. I respect that. And yes, development is great. It makes all these new things happen. I love it. But let's 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 also think that the, re the moment a regression is end of life, that is a working previous E9-3 did not have a problem, and then it was introduced into the tree, and then it shifted into various releases, that regression becomes a default behavior. If you only look at the current software that you maintain, and pay no attention to where that regression came from, you will spend an infinite more time trying to figure out what went wrong. Whereas there is a point in time where one single commit introduced that problem. And I would argue that if you found that one commit, perhaps in a mechanical way, while you slept, you would save yourself nine months of trouble trying to identify when this problem occurred. <laughs> True story. So, rephrased, I wouldn't be looking in the past if you didn't have the regressions hiding in the past. Just problem solved, don't introduce any regressions. Please. <laughs> But that's the nature of software that these things happen, and we all do what we can. And rephrase, I don't like regressions. I consider them sabotage. Thank you, Beastie Boys. There's a lovely song about that name. So let's talk other regressions that perhaps some of you encountered. Famous, uh, with the OS News, but big on Slashdot. 25-year-old bug found in, in FreeBSD and various BSDs. Mark Ballmer of OpenBSD found that. I sat down with Jeremy Ellison at a SNEA storage conference. They do a plug fest for all the different Samba implementations. And he remembered this. We're looking at the Teldir code for the Samba one I mentioned earlier. He's like, could it be? No. No way. Couldn't be. Could yet yeah, it's the same damn code. <laughs> Decades later. Yes, it's a challenge to have a DOS file system later implemented in ZFS and shared over a protocol that attempts to make everyone happy. Yes, it's complex. I get it. But let's all be super attuned to this because it can burn people for decades, unfortunately. And so what is our scope? I know with paleophobia, we don't want to talk about the past. But FreeBFC 1.0 arrived in 93. Unix moved from assembly to C in 73. It is not impossible that regressions are hiding bugs that manifest, how are they manifest, in the majority, 99.9% .9 of my lifetime, which is a scary thought. So let's do some paleophobia counseling. <laughs> uh, I believe our past is our greatest asset. It's how we got here. And also, every release that was ever produced was hopefully the absolutely best software the team whatever team it was, could produce at that time. They thought this is the best combination of new and old things, and that's our release. And take pride in it. Don't look at them as junk. And occasionally, there are legal issues where you need to go back in time and find out if, if code contaminated your source tree from an inappropriate source, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in this context, let's talk about FreeBSD specifically. It's a permissively licensed Unix-like operating system. You wouldn't be here if you're not familiar with it to some degree. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's a nice piece of software. For the context of this talk and what I'm discussing, FreeBSD is a source tree. It's a wonderfully community contributed bit of source out on a server somewhere. It gets checked out to user source. You build that software to produce binaries. There's a command that maybe you are not so familiar with beyond the regime build world and build current is make package system deceptively named, it has absolutely nothing to do with packages, and it produces the familiar base, kernel, source, stocks, you name it, distribution sets. Those are what you install into a system with a tar command. This basic structure hasn't changed in decades, perhaps hasn't changed since BSD at Berkeley, perhaps since Unix, you name it. It works. It's a nice mechanism. I see nothing wrong with it, and it's, it's just how it works. So sources become a source archive, or directly get built. You, for whatever reason, be it active development, be it testing, be it whatever, you modify those sources. And you build what you produce from those, and you repeat the cycle. That is just the, an extremely simplistic version of 
the life of source code and how it becomes a binary and propagates itself around the world. So in all that, that modification step I mentioned, uh, FreeBSD itself has an, a nifty way to flip a switch and turn some stuff off. It's a very large source tree with many, many things in it, in it some critical, some historical and inactively used very often. And for example, there's a switch that lets you turn off send mail. Not everyone likes send mail. Uh, whatever your motivation, you can build it without send mail. Some people building small systems, a router, do not want send mail, okay? Some people hate send mail. They don't want to see M4 ever again in their lives. They want post -tick. Great, do whatever you please. Fortunately, disks are plentiful and large. Size is less a motivator, but in chasing down regressions, having full control over the environment is handy. And in the pursuit of container things, where you have an application contained. So that, that's the key motivation there. This set of switches arrived in FreeBSD 7.0, and I'd argue FreeBSD can package base, which is a term that will mean something to the FreeBSD folks in the room back then. So firing up the time machine looking back in time, uh, that source, build, distribution set model hasn't changed in decades. The old releases are rather easily repackaged for use with the modern tools, specifically BSD install. You may recall floppy size chunk distribution sets, base.aa, 8b, ac, for those who've used FreeBSD for some time. Surprisingly, with zero modification of the contents, those can be repackaged up into a tarball. Uh, go figure, you just splat them into one giant archive uh, containing the appropriate things that have some been, somewhat been separated over the years, but a kernel is a kernel, splat into kernel.txz. And as I'm working with this, I found, wait a minute, I'm waiting for the GZ compression and now XZ compression to compress this tarball, and I'm doing it on a compressing file system, a highly efficient LZ4 ZFS file system. How about I just call it TXZ, even though it's just .tar, the tools won't care, and that's just one time saving tip for those who really want to geek out on these things. And so the current layout with boot slash kernel arrived in FreeBSD 5, and FreeBSD 5 boots in Beehive, the hypervisor in FreeBSD. A little bit most of us know until recently, because no one tried it. Why not? And BSD install itself, the current installer, arrived in FreeBSD 9, for what it's worth. And continuing, I mentioned 7 briefly, that had this ability to switch what's on or off in the operating system. So that makes for 15 years of the familiar layout, more or less, slash boot, slash kernel, which you can pack up in a tarball, and 10 years of little switches you can flip in service of, I'd argue, modern gold. So, as you're about to, some of you are about to walk out, enough of the context. I'm not sensitive to that, I get it, so let's do this. <clears throat> so, Term. Popek and Goldberg laid out the rules for virtualization. I believe fidelity was their term. That was an early term for the authenticity of the virtual machine. If it isn't adequately compatible with the hardware machine, it's useless. And if your, say, ABI is not compatible with the software you're trying to run on it, you have jail fail. Uh, a good real world example there is that FreeBSD has had, to various degrees, Linux compatibility for a very, very long time. And very neat things have been done with Linux compatibility in a jail, where it appears to be Linux. And as the Linux kernel rapidly evolves, it's hard to keep up. And so some, some things work great, some fail catastrophically. Uh, FreeBSD has been very good about preserving ABI compatibility between releases, always looking forward and staying compatible. Great, yay. And if your virtual machine are not providing an authentic environment to operate in, you have major trouble. So in this context, I would like to extend that authenticity, that fidelity to the installation process. I know it's not sexy, I know, I know, but let's, let's, let's explore it. So BSD installs what you use to install free BSD. Uh, 
Uh, it has many things going for it and several shortcomings. It's mostly in BinSH and shell scripts. There are components in C, which do all the partitioning for UFS. Many people use that. Yes, they do. Believe it or not, there's a use case. Please don't delete it. <clears throat> it supports many partitioning schemes. MBR, UFI, GPT. UFI is a, a, a boot strategy that uses some of those. And it's very flexible in that regard. I like that. It supports UFS. It supports ZFS. It supports jelly encryption for the two. Good work, Alan. Much of that. Thank you. <laughs> we have him to thank. And it has a very simple mechanism for a jail installation. You can, this is not super popular, but it's out there. You can do BSD install and give it a, a jail is the verb and a destination. And it drops any user land with no kernel and makes some tiny, tiny adjustments. And I'm like, ooh, that's a good idea. It's not super uh, popular, but it's absolutely the right idea. And by repackaging old stuff, it's suddenly FreeBSD 5.0 compatible, which uh, is tribute to things like TAR in SH and simple Unix conventions that haven't changed in decades. A few cons about BSD install. It assumes you're doing a fresh installation. You install FreeBSD 11.1 on FreeBSD 11.1. It's a somewhat reasonable assumption, but when you're trying to institutionalize virtual machines and contain machines, it becomes a barrier very quickly. Um, let's see, it depends on BSD config, a similarly complex tool that provides some of its neat features. Uh, when trying to develop for it, you have to find yourself running down rat holes to see where a function is. Great, okay. Uh, let's see, beyond uh, a fresh installation of like, okay, it grabs every hard drive you you have available and lets you choose one and assumes you are running it from a, a read-only booted CD USB device, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It depends on the dialog graphical interface, which which is GPL license that is not a long-term project goal. The project includes such so, such software. So that simultaneously means that you're developing on BSD the install in terms of dialog. This interface hasn't been separated from the logic. That frustrating. Some of the components are in C. That is just fine, but for me it was a barrier to entry to poke at them. Uh, I won't argue either way on that one. But most frustratingly, for whatever reason, I believe in part of the context of wrapping all those visual dialog stuff, it traps shell exits. <laughs> When shell programming, it's very handy to dump your variables and exit to see what went on. Well, the way it's architected, it goes into wild loops. If you have a variable wrong, miss a closing quotation mark, anything. And that's most time consuming, unfortunately. So over the holidays, I started writing. This has been nagging me for a very long time. And I knew it would just take sitting down and hacking on it, printing out most of its code to a similar file, marking it up and figuring out where stuff occurs, and hacking on it, and hopefully improving it. So number one, Z pool name collision. It assumes that every Z pool is Z pool. Uh, Z root? The default. Right, one can override it, but when scripting, if you don't pay attention to that, it will attempt to create everything with the same name. Uh, my quick workaround was to add a one, two, three at the end of that if you didn't see this coming so you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, it includes a, a simple line to export all Z pools. Now, if you're running from a ZFS booted host, <coughs> it will attempt to export the host Z pool. So that was easily resolved. I can point you to it, Alan. You're shaking your head. I'll show you the code. Anyway. Uh, it also announced the destination media, so I mean you're done, that's great, which for most users that's just fine. It pulls the boot blocks from the install host. So if you're you must stay in alignment between what you're installing from to what you're installing to. In the course of this, because I'm doing everything scripted, I found two opportunities to not depend on dialogue to provide a progress bar. I will survive without a progress bar and I believe we have a DPV progress bar of sorts in base, but 
Uh, it might also be dialog based. And I've added support what are called, and there's no official term perhaps, Alan, nested boot environments or deep boot environments or Brian Drury boot environments. I'm not sure if that will show up in the handbook, but what that means <coughs> is that rather than embracing the idea that you have shared user, shared bar between different versions of the operating system, you have completely nested uh, directories for any one boot environment. Uh, if you've done computing for some time, you've probably heard of dual booting. You've been trying to do Windows and Linux, and it was always painful. It was agonizing. Well, ZFS has a notion that the root of the operating system can be any arbitrary place in the, the storage device, the Z pool, the file system. And within that, you can have multiple root uh, trees, I suppose. Boot environments is the term for that. It's actually a very good term. It took me a while to wrap my head around it, but yes, it's a roots is a bit ambiguous. So hopefully that is clear. Only say a user would build be at the top level as the as default in case in this case, which is the default name. So this facilitates a greater stray of versions versus say 11.1 and current. And hopefully, and Illumos now uses a free BSD loader, hopefully smart OS and possibly chain loaded NetBSD who just received ZFS. So having spent time attempting to dual boot and pursuing multiple operating systems, this I find quite compelling. So in the 11.1 release, thank you someone who I don't think is here, but there's something called ZFSBE for boot environment. It is a very, very simple R script, RC script that says, hey, if you have these descendant nested data sets, let's mount them on boot. That would be very useful. So it very simply uh, mounts them if it should be mounted to avoid the frustration of, say, having multiple identical user directories and trying to pile them all on top of one another. Bad things happen. We've all done it, we've all been there, and it's a wee frustrating. So I don't know why that flash is white every time I advance, but that's just luck. <clears throat> now, here's a taste of BSD install scripting. Uh, you find a location of your distribution sets. Those are the little tar archives I mentioned earlier. You have a destination, in this case, a memory device, just a RAM disk. You pick a partition scheme. You go, I want the default names here. I've added a flag for nesting, should you want to go that route. I've added a flag for using the boot blocks from the destination. What I've done is do a filter on the, the tar extract of base to find only boot blocks or the boot directory. It's all from there to the destination rather than from the host because, hey, you may not want a ancient boot loader on a new system or a new, system, new loader on an old system. And here's a taste of the UFS support that's been in there a very long time. It works, bless their hearts. <clears throat> so in this case, in practice, I create a RAM disk, now a device. I run the script verb. I mentioned the jail verb earlier, the BSD config verb the script, which is the text you just saw on the last slide. And then in this case, use the in-base Beehive uh, utility VM run and just aim it at the, at the memory disk I created, two gigs of RAM, but get two gigs of RAM and give it a name. Not very exciting. But this little tiny bit of stuff in two slides could be highly scripted. And you could generate those, uh, those BSD install scripts and change versions of whatever you want to fit in the new virtual machines as you please. And it's not horrible, but with these little changes, you can use BSD install for rather scripted uh, deployment of virtual machines in jail. So, hey, achievement unlocked. Um, it's very block storage oriented. There's very extensive partitioning options, like I mentioned, all the different layouts. That's great. It's, it's a, a useful tool, and it's a nice lightweight version of institutionalized virtual machines. So, in that context, maybe a simple VM tab, virtual machine tab, like an FS tab could list your machines. You've got to have a simple R script to just kick things off. Jail has an institutionalized jail management system that I've never met anyone using. Has anyone used the previously built-in jail management tool? Good work, Alan. 
I saw a finger behind him, but anyway, uh, I will call that institutionalization fail if it hasn't latched on. But hey, it's better than nothing, and it is arguably institutionalized, but also not so fast. <clears throat> Previous 8.4 onward supports Vert I.O. Devices needed for virtualization in an effortless manner. Yes, there's various simulation. Uh, Lock devices, as I just mentioned, are useful and have their place, but maybe there are more opportunities. Uh, the regression window, if you're working strictly within, say, Vert IO on FreeBSD and the BSD install, keeps you back, as far back as FreeBSD 4. Suppose you could do yeah, HCI. I think AHCI just support is the key thing. And this will clearly not support other operating systems beyond FreeBSD. So I love ZFS. I love boot environments. I hope their function is totally clear. And I love BSD Unix. And I mean that in terms of I was sat down at it in school in January of 91. And I'm very grateful for that because that's when there was AT&T Unix, maybe HP UX and AIX. And I clearly didn't use Linux because it would not be announced for about eight more months, seven more months. So old school. Uh, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying it was. Great to see the simplicity of that. We're forced to use the internet through text console, and that's the extent of it. <laughs> and watch hundreds of users work on a single humble machine that's less powerful than the phones in our pockets and do their work. So I propose what I'm calling network boot environments. It is largely towards my goal of regression testing, but I'll also hint at how it could be useful for all things Containery, dockery, such. So, uh, why would you do this? Well, FreeBSD has booted from NFS from probably day one. That's a lot longer than all the nifty new storage things that came along. Like NVMe, yeah, NVMe is great, but it wasn't there until recently. AHCI, a newer disk interface, even IDE came along after things like SCSI. So. To really step back and look at a long-term perspective, you have pretty much NFS and SCSI at your disposal, which is okay. <coughs> not bad. So conceptually, ZFS on Solaris and friends Illumos and FreeBSD have a notion of share NFS. You just tell a data set to be shared over NFS and rejoice. It's a, I believe Powell acknowledged that it's a rather hacky piece of code. It was just a a placeholder feature, and it doesn't, for example, check that uh, there's a conflict in the amount points. It, uh, it leaves, uh, in my experience, a, a, an export for long after you've disabled the property, and other fun. So that's a good inspiration. And also the ZFS DE I mentioned earlier and gave some code for is an inspiration to say, OK, here's a tree of of a root file system, let's do the right thing with each component so we're not missing something like user or var or something that just is fundamental to a Unix environment. So that said, it's running through and say mounting things like head. And if you simply mount a boot environment, it's a, a, an operating system in a directory. You can aim to root at that, which may meet your needs. You can aim jail at that, which may meet your needs. There's a place for that. Or you could export it and do something crazy like export the boot environment component by component. And yes, that takes some housekeeping and it was a pain in the butt, but I did it. <laughs> Thank you, ZFSBE, for providing the framework for doing exactly that in an institutionalized FreeBSD manner. And Jinkuya uh, Mariusz, <laughs> there is a component for probing an NFS server for the necessary, typically invisible stuff that's needed for an NFS boot. Yeah, exactly. Either you know exactly what this means, or you don't want to know what this means. But when there's a pixie boot environment of it, this is all handled automatically. But actually, it needs to be done manually. I believe it could be done with grub to beehive. But a handful of you will know exactly what I mean by that. The rest, don't worry. Please, don't worry about it. But this allows you to load a virtual machine with Beehive Load, the default, uh, the adapted Beehive Loader used for Beehive, uh, over NFS. So this 
So it has a memory allocation and a name. Now, uh, you'll think, oh no, you get the root. The very first, which is provided to it, uh, we don't have, say, the rest of these subdirectories, for lack of a better term. So yes, the, the FS tab of the virtual machine needs to be aware of all these components that comprise its system. However, that's all the standard Unix components uh, right off the shelf. And I will admit that's hard. That might be scary, but it works. Now, with this crazy idea, a boot environment by definition boots on the bare metal of the host. You pick one that with the loader, four or seven, and you pick a boot environment and boot to it. Well, as I mentioned, you can mount it and cheroot to it. You can mount it and jail it. You can export it, as I've described with beehive load. You can add to that a TFTP server. The in-base one ID is fine. It's primitive, but it works. And a DHCPD. I've been using the OPSD one, but the IFC one is very, very flexible. And create a PXE netboot environment. In the most traditional sense, just a familiar PXE environment. And from there, you can boot it with Beehive UEFI GOP, which includes a a Pixie probe. It does not clearly say, hey, I'm trying Pixie, but it is there. That's like the dot. The dot is the, the, the lovely communication that is trying Pixie. <coughs> Zen in FreeBSD has PXE support. It's all there. It's all under our noses. And finally, if you've built a PXE netboot environment, there is no reason not to do the traditional thing, which is the hardware boot it. To just point it at a piece of hardware, wake on LAN, and boot another machine from the boot environment on the host. And someone at Beehive Prime made a good point of just blurring the virtual machine and the hardware machine. Philip, maybe you? Well, this is the institutionalized use of a boot environment push to all these destinations. It doesn't care. It is the authentic environment. And hypothetically, that could be FreeBSD 5. Yes, in a boot environment on ZFS. I know that might be upsetting. Push to hardware with all the benefits of ZFS on FreeBSD 5, using absolute protocol compliance. No hacks be on the NFS handle trick. And I'm finding this useful. So, oh, the places you'll go by taking the simple construct that was institutionalized in FreeBSD 11 one with the ZFS BE simple script that says, hey, here's the rest of your file system. Let's do stuff with that. So that's by using a file back to virtual machine in that it is a boot environment with a bunch of files in a directory rather than, for example, that RAM disk I use, which is a block device that you boot to. So, a little proof of concept I've developed, and I hope to have published by the end of this conference. The BE command. Boot environment. <clears throat> I still think commands should be short in Unix. I hope I am on time. I will blast through the rest of this. So, uh, in all these discussions I've had about virtualization management, one source is saying, use the ZFS syntax, duh, by my book. <laughs> and this is my midnight rendering of Alan Jude from the shirt from uh, TechSnap. I hope to make a shirt of that. Anyway, <clears throat> so with the BE command, I create a layout of a boot environment with a L layout FreeBSD which is all those different user this, that, bar this, that, 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 that. I have an OpenBSD layout, I have an Illumos layout, and an NetBSD layout, the closest proximity I could to their default layouts using ZFS. From there, there's a simple command to mount it. And note that I'm giving the pool name, the um, boot environment root. My pool is named BD for block device, just because it's nice and short. BE for boot environment, which is typically root, capital letter, R-O-O-T on FreeBSD. Normally not mounted, but I'm abusing its presence there. I don't see a problem with that. 
and I have a simple way to install FreeBSD from a location of those direct those distribution sets I mentioned of tarball of the OS, multiple tarballs, and I pick an architecture. I pick a release and a choice between branch release or stable. And this all works because I've slammed 5.0 through head into the same layout of G base dot txz kernel dot txz not super controversial and heaven forbid you could actually push around other Unix operating systems which already if they're a BSD follow that layout for the most part because they're all from the same source into that same layout use the exact same tool uh, I have a plan to share NF uh, share NFS and boot it as I've described with the local beehive load and NFS handles and goodies and share PXE, which adds to it a TFTP server and a DHCP server. So you have a net boot environment. Boot PXE uses a built in Beehive UEFI GOP Pixie environment to boot locally. A, and there was some great discussion that Beehive kind of about embedding uh, um, NAT routers and firewalls and goodies in the tools to just make this easier. I poked them in the host OS, but I'm glad that conversation's taking place. And finally, potentially, well, actually, it does work. Wake on LAN, point at a MAC address, and wake up a machine and say, here's your Pixie environment, go boot this thing. And in my case, run a test on it. <coughs> so uh, a flat layout is a term I use for just a single directory for a boot environment. It happens to be the boot environment structure, which you could accidentally choose at the boot loader. But I realized at like 3 in the morning, oops, I just created a NAS with two commands. I, create a data set, I export it. Uh, it would take a little tweaking on users and groups, but oops, sorry, I created this. Um, that said, FreeBSD has an in-kernel NFSD, uh, NFS daemon. It's rather high performance, and its competition in this case is ZFS, a in-kernel summing sophisticated file system. I will work on some exact benchmarks, but I was saturating the underlying disk for NFS to a local machine because I'm not going over a wire, I'm talking to the loop back of the OS, and FreeBSD is actually really good at that. So this isn't as slow as you might think. Challenges. NFS, not a file system. Show of hands, has anyone wrestled with NFS over the years? Boom, 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 boom. yes. So ah, I wasn't quite aware how much file how many databases are hiding in the operating system? Not in any traditional sense, not like a big transactional database, but like uh, the Zen Store D database and the package, the FreeBSD package manager database, even though it's a list of stuff. So uh, that can be frustrating because there's a different locking mechanism for <coughs> NFS. So even if the database is the equivalent of a three-line text file, it has its own unique locking mechanism that is not uh, compatible with uh, NFS. And there are tricks like throwing it in tempfs. Uh, you can install your packages, but then you have no history of your packages. And there is a fix in package that may not have been properly applied that does fix that to allow for NFS use. But I proposed a GSOC project to audit FreeBSD and others for NFS use and the only use. I was very happy that OpenBSD folks pointed out that OpenBSD did a, an audit of read-only and other environments where what if you, what if your root file system has changed from read-write to read-only over the course of the boot, and what happens at shutdown? Does it do the right thing? I don't know. And also, since FreeBSD 6, there has been a diskless convention, which puts the operating system into select uh, um, if you will, archives of certain portions of the file system so that they're accessed through like a traditional disk as opposed to a network disk. Lots of tools to play with. <clears throat> so device support also becomes a challenge. As I mentioned, uh, FreeBSD 8.4 supports for I.O., very virtualization friendly, that's great. Uh, modern disks, AHCI arrived in FreeBSD 8. Because we're network booting, it actually puts most of the load on the network interfaces. So uh, the Despite the fact that FreeBSD 5 and 5.2 have similar Intel network interfaces, they are similar but different. But there happens to be a working 
but not committed to any 2,000 device. So you can have a nice uh, 10 100 link to an ancient operating system. And there is an ATA emulation project that somehow started on FreeBSD 10 and was never tested on anything older, so it actually does not go as far back as the HCI support goes, which is a bummer. I hope to also provide a proof of concept of a BD command for block devices. Uh, conceptually, I realize BSD itself perhaps should be broken just handling block devices, handling file devices, and it does for jails, which is just scratching the surface. But uh, there are many opportunities for, say, setting up Z pools and all that, and spanning, say, a Z pool between two controllers so that a mirror is split between them, and that's some logic that's out there in various forms, but definitely has not made it into previous DMs install. So when you take block devices and manage them, have a file, o file level OS manager as they described, you have essentially an installer combining the two and done in like two commands. <laughs> and you also have a NAS for free that comes along with the deal. So philosophical challenges, I'll go pretty quick because I think we might be a little short on time. And like I said, I've got a lot of information to share. Oh no, it's in bin SH. Oh, you should really use C. No, wait, Ruby's in fashion. Oh, no, 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 no. Go is in fashion. No, 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 no. Lua's in fashion. Okay, Rust is now the way to go. This whole idea of forklift upgrading and jettisoning the installer in the OS is a bit frustrating. Congratulations, OpenBSD, for having a simple shell script for decades. I've considered porting that to FreeBSD. Um, it's simple. You can like balance this on the enter command, and it will typically install correctly. Uh, it would also be awesome if these tools had received, say, 20 years of refinement as opposed to forklift build and tear down. The same goes for configuration tools. You can do a lot of set with set knock and shell on a like environment FreeBSD on FreeBSD. Anyway, I think those tools will work for, say, decades from FreeBSD 1 through ahead, but that's just me alone. Enough. I think it works really well to have same defaults and overrides. Uh, you end up with a, by default, end up with a working system and have infinite configurability. If you talk to a network engineer, they want as many VLANs as humanly possible and the storage should just work. It should be brain dead simple. If you talk to a storage engineer, they want all the block size control and, and control, 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 and the network should be brain dead simple. If you talk to an application developer, they want precise version control of the, op of the application and the networking and the storage should be brain dead simple. So it's like, oh, come on, wait, 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 wait. Same defaults and overrides allows you to satisfy all these highly opinionated people. So as we run through all this, eyes on the prize. Uh, if you've attended my previous talks, you may see a trend here. Multiplicity, virtualization and containers, Beehive came along, graphing all this through with graphite, say when chasing regressions and watching performance. I talked about the block device layers. I presented on Smart, which is an in-base tool that hasn't reached base, but it's a very simple smart utility for probing block devices. What if the installer checked the health of your disks before committing to them? What a concept. And BeehiveCon is now in its fifth year this year, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so in chasing regressions, when you have these tools, if you have a list of re releases, and one, and zero, eleven one, spit it into a shell loop, create Virtual machines, boot them, run your tests, do whatever. Uh, I'd argue it's debuggable in moments. <laughs> it is scalable in crazy ways and very, very flexible. But that's maybe me. So in chasing regressions, I have a simple script to run through the, the path, the default path, and it's uh, places like user bin and seeing if there's a man page for the thing it finds. Are we improving on the ratio of man pages to components or not? Let's go find out and let the machine find out. And I believe the previous e policy is for any one release to build the previous and the future one. Well, while I sleep, I would like the system to go build and just see what it can build and not build. Great, and then document it. And document it once, because this is all, all read-only history. It just needs to be sitting on wiki somewhere and save everyone else the trouble. And of course, look for individual regressions like the ones I mentioned at the very beginning. More housekeeping. FreeBSD has an archive of its previous releases. It's missing things like checksum. I don't know if it's on ZFS. I don't quite know who maintains it beyond a school. I've heard one name that I wrote down in my little book somewhere. 
I know that Gavin is interested in giving that some attention. I would love to contribute my massaging to that so that maybe there is an authentic repo and then a repackaged repo that follows the modern conventions. The binaries don't change, just like layout, the naming, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I've repackaged 5.0 onward. I have a script to do it. You can do it yourself. Also, I proposed a GSOC project for that auditing I mentioned. And this last few days, I've been fighting what's called source.conf, which is all those knobs to control the operating system. Free BSD developers often, it seems, don't know about that. So they create something and create dependencies. So if you don't have <coughs> freak out, if you don't have networking, the tool either gets installed and fails, or if you don't have uh, SSL is a popular one. If you have a nifty display like this, you probably don't need fancy networking or even want it. So yes, there are use cases for removing components that are close to your heart, and I love your heart because trust people. And so, Michael, why are you doing this, my god? So, you take the scripted installer, which could be perhaps two commands, one for locked devices, one for uh, boot environments. You completely split at a complete low level, OS level, institutionally, the hardware host and the virtual machine by having a boot environment that can show up as a jail, as a PXE, you name it. You can isolate it with the various tools, old school true, jail, beehive, zen, VMM, OpenBSD, you name it. You have a, this will take a lot of work, but it, the framework's there, and I think people are just are lazy. You have knobs to say, I don't want send mail, which is the example I gave, gave earlier. You turn off all the things, or enable the ones you need, or key point, Enable the ones you need for your little specific application you are deploying. So I would argue that most of the Dockery stuff can be achieved with in-base tools, ancient in-base tools. Any Docker users? Not a single hand. Or the live stream, not a single hand with them. So, or, going full circle, institutionalized, virtual, isolated, and virtual hosts. Now that raises a question. The container movement is upon us, yay. So does the container movement expose flaws in the Unix model? Have brilliant folks come along and looked at Unix and said, you've screwed this up, you're missing these components, we add all this new stuff. Kubernetes <coughs> came up at the at BIcon yesterday and it's big. And any Kubernetes users in the room? Not a single hand. Any uh, OpenStack users? One, two, CloudStack. One, great, cool. Or rather than exposing flaws in the Unix model, is it exposing misunderstandings of the Unix model? Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. That was the entire first part where I hacked BSD installed to do that. So you, I ended up with a few line config file. You can automate it however you please. And it doesn't attempt to, yes, Alan, it tries to remove the, uh, unmount the host Z pool along with every other Z pool. So yes, I'd argue, I almost stopped there. I thought this is great, but I pointed out that by doing so, you lose any awareness of previous versions rather rapidly, which for regression testing, if a regression can hide somewhere between 73 and 2018 and 19 onward, for my purposes, great, but I can hook you up with that if you like. I'll show you the exact code. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, I'm afraid of, I don't know really about the current Beehive implementation. First question is, current Beehive support of PC? I don't know. UEFI GOP today. UEFI. The GOP. It's the UEFI firmware that acts as a bootloader, acts as a PXE loader, and bypasses Beehive load. It's been very popular with Linux distributions because there's no tinkering with Grub Beehive and all the now increasing version compatibility issues. So yes, I, I will gladly explain that in the hallway. Yeah. I 
five kernel via the beehive. I'm a, I'm working while about the HTTP matching treatment at good time. Learn your program. What at good time? HTTP matching treatment. I'm wondering why why the five kernel can do via the beehive. So I, I'm sorry, not, I've not been repeating the questions, but uh, the first was about Pixie support in Beehive. The second one is about booting FreeBSD5 in Beehive. I manually load the root over NFS. I need to do a few tricks to give it the proper environment that Pixie normally takes care of. But it works, and I'll gladly show you after the, after the presentation. I hope that answers your question. Others? Would any of you find this useful in your work? Or is it strictly useful for regression, regression testing over decades of, of software? It's too early in the morning for such a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be here today and tomorrow. Please corner me. I'm actively developing this. It's very useful for my purposes because it's driven my real world experiences in regression. Thank you so much. <laughs>